31st Headwaters Conference, friends. Usually I'm looking out uh, from Taylor Auditorium at about 500 of you, and uh, we celebrate what it means to be active residents, uh, ecological citizens of the Headwaters region. This is not a conference necessarily about water, it's about what does it mean to live at the Headwaters of the West, and how do we build solidarity across Headwaters communities to co-create uh, solutions for the future to build a more resilient headwaters. You can see our, our dear friends here for her second visit to the Headwaters Conference, Winona LaDuke. Thank you so much, Winona, for being here. And those of you who have been to Headwaters Conferences before, you know we have some rituals. Uh, we have, for example, uh, Headwaters Hill is a mountain officially named. Uh, thank you, George Sibley, for that, our founder. Uh, after the Headwaters Conference, it flows into three different watersheds. We have Aaron Abeda. Uh, American Book Award winning poet and mayor of Antonito and director of our poetry MFA here at Western. Uh, he did a book called Letters from the Headwaters. We've got a, got a book. We also have a sort of opening poem and song. And so, you know, I, I just want to say that this year's topic is, is particularly important given what's going on in the world. It's serious, it's heavy, but um, it's also a time to, to celebrate creativity and vision together. And um, you think about the things that we've been facing, you know, climate change uh, becoming a, 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 as, as real, uh, orange skies in San Francisco, CNN tracking seven hurricanes, uh, but we're also seeing the climate injustices emerging through COVID. And COVID has been sort of a magnifying glass uh, placed upon the social injustices that suffer from climate change and COVID, right? Depending on uh, your cultural background, we know that um, racially communities of color are much more vulnerable to both COVID and climate change, depending on historically, and this is driven by white supremacy and where uh, your community was built, how close to a power plant, how far from food systems, you may be facing higher asthma rates a higher diabetes rates, higher obesity rates, making you more vulnerable to COVID, but also living in areas that face climate chaos much more dramatically with fewer choices for adaptation. And so when we think about this year in which the Black Lives Matter movement has also pushed us to think and ask some really hard questions about systems of white supremacy, we also have to understand that the Black Lives Matter movement and the conversations it sparked are, is not a third topic separate from COVID and climate. These topics all live together. Uh, they are mutually reinforcing in scary ways. It calls for us to have our solutions be mutually reinforcing in very hopeful ways. So I wanna to start tonight with a poem, I think of great hope and vision from dear friend, Art Good Times. Uh, Art Good Times is one of the founders and elders of the Headwaters Conference. And uh, he was actually a five-time uh, county commissioner in San Miguel County for the Green Party. And um, if you want to kind of really get to know where Art's heart is this day, uh, or these days, uh, Google Telluride Institute and look for his Talking Gourds Poetry Program. And it'll allow you a chance to participate in the kind of beautiful work Art does. Art, go ahead and show your screen and I'll hand it off to you, my friend. The Art of getting lost. Okay, so there's this rainbow family hippie hitching down to the gunny from the butte. And up pulls a Winnebago with Texas plates and the tinted window rolls down. Howdy, pilgrim. Can you show me the way to the nearest wilderness? Blah, 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 parking, blah, 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 blah. And our hippie says, hey man, get lost. But I say, before you lose it, look closely because it's not so much you losing it as the place that takes you away. It's slick rock deer trail, thick with juniper, takes you away. It's avalanche, make a shale, wild strawberry shoot, takes you away and suddenly, you're just another neo-pagan Zen mother Buddha, Ola Kala, Pantare, exploring pandemonium, toking pure chaos. Cougar in the headlights takes you away. 
morning chanterelles in a spruce fir meadow take you away. Or maybe it's at a table over breakfast where some resort town waitron Venus Kali clone takes you away and falling in love. You lose it. Take Luna and the mushrooms and quack grass rolling in it on Sheep Mountain that first green-eyed summer. Or take that infamous hike we took to the San Miguel Canyon petroglyph that scribed a hoop in the earth and led us back to our beginning. Remember, you can't lose what you haven't found. Double rainbow on Dallas Divide, glamoring hands and knees up lone cone spree, uncompagres tabwatch pine scratched by bear, getting so lost you find yourself. Toad Kachino Grotto Vision on Nevati Kiaovi, the San Francisco peaks, takes you away. Big Sur, hot spring, crotch of the redwood, full moon pull, takes you away. Pacific Rin combers in a salt point storm, slamming down fists, takes you away. Letting go enough not to panic, but to play it like a tune whistled and hummed as a hymn to the mother. Easy bro. Aliakala's charm takes you away. Yo, eating mangoes and making love with the CK Vakalalao takes you away. This is my religion. I believe in being lost. So everything I find in the way is Stamilagro. And what finds me? I try to field, thinking adventure, not predicament, chasing chaos just as much as calm. The only straight lines on the headwaters are the rifle's scope and the map's compass. So scram pathfinders, surveyors, engineers, give me the loons, zigzag walk. Let me lose it. I know how to use it. Woo! Thank you, Art. <laughs> we just went from the sound of 500 people applauding to the sound of my own voice applauding. So that was incredible, Art. I know everyone out there is applauding. And, and I just, you know, heard it in a different way from not being out in the crowd. I just want to thank you, Art. I love you. Everything you've done for this headwaters, these headwaters communities, thank you. And for the students who are new to headwaters, take the art of getting lost seriously. It's about the things that help you transcend the ego. And when you let go of what you think you know this weekend, the art of getting lost, your learning might be transformative. Thank you, art. To continue with our headwaters traditions, uh, we have a local guru of pretty much everything and dear friend of mine, Alan Wartes. Um, you know, Alan uh, oversees Alan Wirtes Media, and uh, one of the things that he wants you to check out is uh, actually an MEM student, one of our master students, uh, put together a podcast called Wildish with, with Alan. If you want to see this on High Country News' website, hcn.org, but for tonight, we're going to enjoy the Headwaters Anthem. Now, we're used to be able to sing along with this, Alan, so I am trusting the, the people across the country, maybe around the world, to as loud as they can when they, when they really learn your course. Thank you, my friend. Yeah, this song um, is one that I wrote 30 years ago at George Sibley's request. And I have to introduce it by saying it's, it's really at the opposite end of the spectrum from Art's beautiful poem. This is the reality check to living at the headwaters. <laughs> came to the mountains one beautiful May. I just sold my beach house out in California, yeah. With a buttload of money and a Mercedes Benz, I came to start my life over again. So I packed up my Levi's and my new cowboy hat. A poodle named Fifi and my big yellow cat. The flowers were blooming when we crossed the divide. The sign said entering paradise. And 
its purple mountains majesty upon the fruited plain now i think i really do understand why we call it the home of the brave i bought me a chateau with a breathtaking view I planted tomatoes on the first day of June. Those maters were frozen on the 4th of July with six inches of snow in my drive. But I barely had time to recover from that when a rancher shot Fifi and the coyotes ate my cat. The neighbors filed suit Cause I dammed up the creek It was one hell of a week And it's purple mountains Majesty Above the fruited plain Now I think I really do understand Why they call it the home of tried to find work i took around my resume i asked how many tax lawyers live here would you say they answered it could be a hundred and ten but they're all working at the holiday inn and i'd never noticed that sign on my road it said no winter maintenance 20 miles from my home. The county officials weren't answering the phone. A recording said you're on your own. And it's purple mountains majesty above suddenly attracted and very far away fruited plain. Now I think I really do understand why we call it the home of the brain. Because the day after Christmas, it was 40 below. I didn't know my thermometer went down that low. My car said, uh-uh. Then the septic tank froze. I lost all feeling in my toe. So I'm back where I started out in California. Yay. I'll take my chances with the landslides and quakes. But after all I've been through, I won't sit around and moan. Now I've got a cool second home. And it's purple mountains majesty above the fruited plain now i think i really do understand why we call it the home of the brave we call it the home of the brave Thank you so much. And uh, I'm happy for you, Alan. I just want to say that in the last year, Alan uh, rebought his uh, old Earthship dream home that he built with his own hands here in Gunnison when I think he was an undergrad. So congratulations, Alan, and thank you for that beautiful song. Uh, and then there are many people to thank, you know, uh, Amanda Castile, Denny, Dave Primus, Rich Stromberg. They're the folks often behind the scenes who, you know, make the intellectual life of the students and the faculty and the community experts run smoothly. So thank you to them. And really, you know, uh, Winona, this is not just an introduction to you. This is a, a, a offering of gratitude to you because you really, I think, kind of sent very he uh, healthy shockwaves through the program when you spoke here in 2011. And what I'll never forget uh, is you got us to rethink sustainability. You know, it's such a, a technical uh, term sometimes, right? 
uh, sometimes very top down. Um, and um, you pushed us to think about sustainability on a thousand year scale. You showed us a picture of a squash, uh, that, you know, a gourd that had been dug up in your region a uh, while back, right? And there was you know, some debate, some of the, the Western scientists thought, oh no, you, you, you preserve this, Let, let's put this in the Smithsonian or something. And, and the elders in the community, right? They said, no, no, you crack it open, you plant it. And I remember you saying to the audience, you know, like what had to be sustained even through the violence of colonialism, what had to be sustained for those elders to have that confidence to crack that gourd open, right? What instructions from ancestors and creator had to be sustained? What relationship with the soil? What linguistic um, teachings had to be continued for them to have that confidence in you know, many generations beyond them? And I think that really challenged us because suddenly we are having a conversation around the only sustainability metric that matters is what from your culture is still going to have meaning in 800 years, if anything, and, and especially if it's the core of who you are. And it really, you know, challenged the conversation here. And I want to thank you for that. And you uh, invited uh, me to visit you on White Earth, and I was able to hang out with you twice there. I'm so grateful for your hospitality. And the other thing that really changed the discourse in this program was when you introduced me to somebody at White Earth you know, who said, oh, you're a philosopher. The only question that matters is what kind of ancestor do you want to be, John? Right? And, and, and I haven't stopped wrestling with that question since, as you know. Um, you and I last saw each other at a conference called, what kind of ancestor do you want to be in California? And so, you know, your biograph, your, your biography is incredibly impressive. I'll say a few things about it now, but I think you have a relationship with the headwaters and with Western that we're all so grateful for. And a lot of students here, been wrestling with this ancestor question without even knowing that it, you in many ways are the reason why they're thinking about it here. Um, so thank you. Everybody that does not know Winona LaDuke, um, you know, know that, you know, she's most famous sometimes for 96 and 2000. She was the VP running mate for Ralph Nader when he ran for president for the Green Party. Um, but she's done so much since then. Uh, you know, the White Earth Land Recovery Project, Honor the Earth, and her visionary books, like All Our Relations and The Recovery of the Sacred and the Leduc Chronicles. And one of my favorite novels, by the way, your novelist, Last Standing Woman. Um, I've read it several times. I just, I'll, I will keep returning to it. Thank you for that. Um, but everybody should also know that Winona is not just uh, an economic uh, thinker and visionary, not just uh, an activist uh, who's been a, a political candidate, an author, but she's a social entrepreneur. And I think you're gonna hear some of that from her tonight. So please join me in welcoming Winona LaDuke. Welcome, Winona. You just have to unmute there. Anin, Anin, didn't wait back into it. Can you hear me okay? Um, Anin, uh, thanks so much for having me tonight. Uh, pleasure, Alan and Art, to listen to you and to kind of be at your, be in your world here. Um, I'm up here on my uh, northern Minnesota on my farm. I quarantined up here about, uh, you know, in March with about uh, six or seven 14 year olds. A lot of kids didn't go to school anymore. So I just decided to stay home and farm. And um, so here's my corn. Um, this is a Mandan variety. I'm gonna talk a little bit about this later, but it was a good year to farm good year to do something else here. I'm gonna sh show you some pictures from my community and um, John's just gonna have to let me know that I got this showing. <laughs> Can you guys all hear me there? Excuse my little. We, we can hear you. And while you're digging around for that, everybody, you know, there will be a, a Q and A there. Yeah. Uh, but we won't take them from the chat. You'll wanna, type under Q&A. But go ahead, Winona, did you, were you able to share a screen? I don't see it yet. I'm trying to share it again here. Seems like it's here or something. Hold on a second, team. I really apologize for my momentary. Oh, no. And I know- How's that? Can you see it? Hmm. I wonder if it's like a different party now. Well, Dave, Dave does have a backup and you can just say- hey, Dave, let us join and talk about the slides that you present then. All right. <laughs> Wait a second. Yeah, you know, okay. 
So, you know, the first slide I have is one that talks about being relatives in Dinaway Mugginaduk. You got that? Are you finding it? I don't know why it won't show now, huh? Y'all had me showing it earlier. How's that? Got it. Go. You got it. Okay, you got it. Okay, thank you. That's you. All right, so um, this art is some art from our area. I always like to kind of talk about different worldviews. And um, this, um, this is a, a, a artist from my, my neck of the woods and it was called uh, uh, Relatives and did away mugging and took. And so, you know, in this time that we are in, it's a pretty epic moment. Um, you know, the, the, it is a moment of great transformation and change. And I just say, let us, let's do it. You know, I, I think about Erin Dottie Roy and, and her writing, and she talks about um, pandemics as portals, talking about the idea that uh, uh, coronavirus has made the mighty kneel and brought the world to a halt like nothing else. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine the world anew. This is no different. It's a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We could choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice, our hatred, our avarice, our data banks and dead ideas, our dead rivers and smoky skies behind us. Or we could walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and fight for it. And that's this moment. There is not a person listening here who is out there that doesn't know that you know, you have a social crisis, a health crisis, a climate change crisis, a political crisis, and an economic crisis. St idols are falling and statues are crumbling, and so now is the time for the movement to, for social transformation. So let us talk about that. Next slide, please. I show you where I live, Gawawiyakamug, Ground Lake. We are also the headwaters. I'm the headwaters of the Red River, which flows to Hudson Bay. My reservation has both the headwaters of the Mississippi and the Red going to the north and to the south. Next picture, please. And what I want to remind you is, is that, uh, um, you know, when we begin to save, the, save re, 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 you know, rematriate, and, and, and uh, as we make the change, first you got to save the life that is. And I think about that because you live also in a beautiful place, but I, you know, we all know some things. And one of the things we know is that the biodiversity of the world is diminishing because of what I call Windigo economics, the economics of a cannibal, the en endless levels of consumption, you know, it is, uh, it is entirely, uh, the di biodiversity is just diminishing, but on a worldwide scale, where there's biodiversity, there's also usually indigenous people. Let's say we're about 4% of the world's population and we protect about 75% of the world's biodiversity. So when we talk about how we're going to, to make things right, you know, we, we need to talk about protecting the biodiversity that is. And then, um, you know, where I am right now, it's kind of a funny thing to talk to y'all about, but I'm in Northern Minnesota. We call this the deep North up here. And tonight, the president of the United States descended on northern Minnesota. This is about 20 miles from here. <laughs> talking about making America great again. I want to talk about making America great. My idea of when America was great is when there was 8,000 varieties of corn. That is when America was great. On the next slide, please. Tremendous agrobiodiversity. When there were 50 million buffalo, single largest migratory herd in the world, transforming ecosystems and maintaining a prairie of 250 species of grass. That is when America was great. When the skies were blackened with passenger pigeons and you could drink the water from every river, stream, or lake. That's when America was great. Can I have the next slide, please? And this is my great land here. This is our, our wild rice lake, big rice lake. It's called Lower Rice Lake. It, and that, what you're looking at, it looks like a pasture, but that is wild rice. And this next week, I'm going to go take to canoe. That's me and one of my, one of my good sister friends there, Don Goodwin, out looking at the, at the rice here last year. Next picture, please. So the transformation in the moment that we're in, we all kind of know, you know, and, and what I'm saying is, is that these statues are crumbling and the crises 
is, is, has been magnified. There's a lot of things they taught in school. I went to school a long time, you know, and they kept talking about how, uh, how size matters and how great, you know, to be big, to be big was great. <laughs> it isn't. And we see that now because historically like a pandemic, you know, some pandemics take really long time to move around. Bubonic plague that takes some decades to move around. But in this time, what we find out is, is that, is that um, the bubonic plague spread from China through the Silk Roads to Europe. 1918, the Spanish plague, the Spanish flu spread from Spain to France and Britain in June by the fall. COVID-19 took a few days. <laughs> March, two countries and 51,000 nations around the world have one or more direct suppliers in Wuhan. And so what we learned is, is that we had created this centralized system of manufacturing and globalization, which has been represented to us as being the way to go. And it turns out that it crumbles with a bat. <laughs> I just want to just like, sometimes I think about this and I think about, you know, a long time ago, indigenous people, we always said, this is not the first time y'all heard this, like, don't pick a fight with mother nature. That's a really bad idea. Don't pick a fight with mother nature, you won't win. Well, it just shows you don't win picking a fight with mother nature and the origin of COVID is a bat, is a bat. And I think about that, that the natural world, you know, a bat, nobody cares about a bat and that biodiversity. Nobody cared if that little bat had a habitat and look what happens, all hell breaks loose, man. So there's this conflict between the worlds and, and it is our time that we have now and this opportunity to make the structural adjustment that needs to happen in the first world so that the rest of us can survive. So that's, that's this moment that I'm in. Now let's go to the next slide and see if I can remember where we are at. Moment of truth, moment of truth, when you gotta sum it up kind of all your power. You know, the social movements that we have seen since Standing Rock have, have grown stronger and stronger and stronger. And so, you know, I think about that because there's a fire under social movements. Transformation doesn't happen because of federal policy. Transformation does not happen. You know, it happens a convergence of, of moments. And, you know, when Exxon fell off of the S&P and the Dow, <laughs> the largest corporation and the richest corporation in the world is like no longer in the private club. We know that times are changing. And we also know that power does not concede without struggle. And so, you know, that in the final stages of the fossil fuel empire, which you face down there in Colorado and we face here with the tar sands pipelines they propose to put through our territory, you're seeing the systems are crumbling, you know, and I, and I, and I say, keep pushing. Next picture. This is um, what I call the sitting bull plan. You know, we could call it the Green New Deal. I don't know, like, I don't really have a really good name for this, but there's like the Green New Deal is what is referred to in Congress. It is based in some ways on the Marshall Plan or the previous New Deal. So if we are discussing the Marshall Plan, we should just call this the sitting bull plan. Because Sitting Bull, being the great political leader, you know, what he said a long time ago, among many things he said, he was, he was a leader who was also a spiritual leader, you know, and with his people. But he said, uh, let us put our minds together to see what kind of future we can make for our children. And that's his time. You know, there's not one answer. There's not one smart guy out there with a silver bullet of technology that's going to save us. This is the time to roll up your sleeves and make change. So let's talk about that change. Next picture, please. Okay, well, here we are with our biodiversity and indigenous peoples. First thing you do is you save the, save the, the biodiversity. Make sure that stays there. Protect the Amazon rainforest, protect the boreal forest, protect the wild places, you know? I think about this a lot because I live where the wild things are right here. Last, last, last week I saw a wolf on the road. You know, I see all kinds of things up here. I got frogs, I got butterflies, I got life. I have dogs too. Next picture. Yes, very nice to see you. Um, you know, in the, in the time of climate change, I find it really interesting that um, Monsanto and Syngenta, the big guys, are looking for ways to um, make climate change safe varieties. I think it's $1.36 million, a lot of money just to make a climate change safe variety, 13 million, excuse me, dollars for a climate change safe variety, when it turns out that what you really need is biodiversity. And so in the <laughs> Dogs are allowed to the poor lesser. And, and so in, in the biodiversity that exists, these are some pictures for the potato farm in, in um, 
Peru? Yeah, it's in Peru. Hey, knock it off. Get off my corn. Sit on. Please, my dog is trying to sit on my corn pile here. <laughs> um, in this, you know, what they're studying down there is which of these potato varieties does well at which altitudes and in climate change. And so really quite often the answer is, is in the biodiversity is not in a monocrop, but is it having a lot of different crops. So you guys grow a lot of potatoes down there too. You should grow some really cool potatoes. I grew 16 varieties of potatoes this year. That's what's really interesting to me. Next picture. Hey, get off there. Get out of there. You can't sit on the corn. There's the squash. That's the... Um, I grew this squash and this Lakota squash this year. This is uh, the Gete Okosaman. And uh, you know, we, it, that squash, really old squash, you know, it's like 800 years old and, the, and, it was, uh, and they found uh, the seeds in a gourd is the way the story was told to me. And then they crack open the gourd and there's these seeds and it grows this squash. Well, this squash is being grown everywhere now. We, we let it, that, it out of the gourd and there's hundreds of, there's thousands of people growing this squash now, and it's a really good keeper. And I'm thinking about that because I this year I grew some of this squash, but I grew this other squash called this Lakota squash. And the reason I'm talking about it is that you got to relocalize your food system because, uh, you know, we all saw what happened in the beginning of COVID is the, the collapse of the American food system, the industrial food system, where they're killing millions of pigs and squishing all these um, eggs and everything, dumping milk. You know, and in that whole process, what we found is that we should probably try to figure out how to grow food ourselves. And so if you look nationally, you'll find that like and internationally, all the seed companies, they entirely rolled out sales and they had like quadruple sales in seed companies this spring of everybody wanting to, to, to be the people that would um, um, grow the, you know, be able to grow their own food. Next picture. This is the, um, um, and we need to quit wasting stuff. That's the other thing we need to do. Um, because, you know, we want to start changing the food system. What we need to say, you know, they say that there's a billion people in the world that are starving and a billion that are obese. And most of the obese ones are over here. And so just think about like rebuilding food systems, relocalizing, but you also got to start with reducing the waste that is in those systems. Next slide, please. You waited and I'm, I'm working. Are you okay? No. Yes. My grandson just got out of the hospital, so I was all worried he called me. And then um, I decided that I'd be part of the new green revolution. I said I'd call hemp. You guys already legalized cannabis there in, in uh, Colorado, but you know, it's not just about like every, it should be legalized across the board, the 10,000 uses for it. But I'm, I'm even more interested in not just the medicinal value of it, but also um, the value of the hemp. So the reason I'm interested in hemp, you know, I really like the idea that the, you know, that the word canvas comes from cannabis. The word canvas comes from cannabis. Now, how revolutionary is that? And they say that around 1920, we had a choice between a carbohydrate economy and a hydrocarbon economy. And the carbohydrate economy was um, hemp. And the hydro hydrocarbon economy is what we got. But I just think about that because those words are so close, a carbohydrate or a hydrocarbon economy. We just made the wrong choice. Anything you can do with gas, you could do or with fossil fuels, you could do it with cannabis oil or with hemp. Um, and so I want to be part of the new green revolution because that's what hemp represents. Because you could transform from a fossil fuels economy, you could transform the materials economy of this country to an economy that is based on hemp. But part of the strategy that I think is really important or, or is really the philosophy. And, you know, with, with, with all due respect, you know, to cannabis growers, I'm, you know, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm in support of all of the re revolution but you know, it really needs to be not about the money, but about the transformation that is possible with this plant. And so, you know, I'm 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 interested in um, at, I'm Winona's hemp farm here. That's where I'm that's where I'm talking from is Winona's hemp and heritage farm. We're growing out fiber hemp varieties. Uh, next picture, please. There's our fiber hemp varieties. 
That's a couple sons of mine. My team, this is my home. This is basically my extended family. And uh, that's what we grow is uh, we grow corn, beans, squash, potatoes, uh, Jerusalem artichokes, tobacco, and hemp. And uh, so what I want to do is build an intertribal hemp cooperative in the Northern Plains as a part of the transformation of a Northern Plains economy into a, a, an economy that hemp, which could, you know, not only provide uh, fabric and textiles and rope and make cars and, and uh, make buildings and houses and paper and be something you could eat and transform the world with that stuff. Next picture. Here's some of the statistics, which a lot of you know, and I think a lot of about it, particularly in terms of fabrics, that's what I'm interested in, and largely because, as you see here, cotton, 25% um, of the world's pesticide use, 4% of the world's agriculture, 25% cotton. You know, we just need to move on, and uh, hemp represents that opportunity, but she has to be treated right. She has to be treated with respect. Next picture. Building materials. We're doing a hempcrete workshop this next week up here on the reservation. Next one. Biodegrading. Next picture. So it's not just about smoking it. <laughs> it's also about making the next economy with it. And then um, the question of the energy revolution. So here on White Earth, you know, so basically I'm telling you this story, but part of the story I'm also telling you is, is that I, I used to travel around the world. I used to travel places like Colorado, everywhere. And now I don't, I just stay home. And, and so I just looked around my own village and I said, let's just make the new green revolution. Let's just make the just transition. Looks like they're all in crisis, let's just do it. So here we are trying to be coherent, doing our best. Eighth Fire Solar, that's our solar thermal panel manufacturing facility solar thermal panel manufacturing facility. So let me show you this next picture. That's us putting solar thermal panels up on our house. Uh, south facing wall can save about 20% of your heating bill. You guys should be doing this down there in Colorado too. You should buy some solar panels from us, send them down there. Next one. There's our uh, facility and some people visiting our facility. Next picture. Wind power from our tribes is very significant. I probably used this slide nine years ago. It, the, the wind power is kind of maintained the same, although getting to be a little more these days. Next one. Ah, this is my favorite thing. You know, so say we're gonna rebuild this country. We gotta rebuild the infrastructure of this country. And everybody likes to, you know, people, infrastructure is like not sexy stuff. It's like railroads and sewer and pipes and. It's all falling apart. We've got a DN infrastructure in this country. That's one of the things that makes me so mad about the pipelines. It's like, it's not I'm opposed to pipelines. It's opposed that I'm, I'm opposed to oil pipelines for oil companies. I want water and sewer pipes. So this is an idea called solutionary rail. And uh, what this is, is uh, electric trains. It turns out that they're about 80% more efficient than uh, diesel trains. They're the way to go. And if you run them on a direct current, you could also power them with renewable energy. And so the idea is to power an electrical train grid with a much higher level of efficiency as a way to move stuff around the country, including people. It'd be nice to have a train system that wasn't an embarrassment to Bulgaria. That's what someone called it. Like we would be an embarrassment to Bulgaria. Our train system is so bad. So what we need to do is, is just be way smarter. Next picture. And this is an interesting uh, show because it, it turns out, uh, yeah, we want all the trains back and we want the trains to carry stuff that's not toxic on it. That'd be great. And we want more people to be able to be on the trains. A lot of, a lot of you like, you know, back in the last century, I used to travel by train in Europe. That was a long time ago. No, but my point is, is that, you know, uh, yeah, cannabis train tours. I see people writing notes here. This is, to, but a lot of these trains, these railroads run through Indian reservations because they, they chopped up our reservations with these trains. And so we want, a, we want, we want a piece of this. <laughs> I feel like that's what justice looks like too. When we talk about land back or restorative justice, you got to talk about return of land and you got to return of, talk about return of right of ways that have been illegally taken from tribes, return them with these trains and, and go electric. Next picture. Yeah, this is the one that shows how backwards we are. 
Does that look backwards? I feel like we're very backwards. 1% of our trains are electric. Anybody who's a smart country has electric trains. Next picture. Go local solar. This is Melina Lubakon. I got to be on her master's committee at the University of Victoria. She, she, uh, she's from this village called, called uh, uh, she's Lubakon from Little Buffalo in Northern Alberta. And um, her village, the health clinic was powered by a diesel generator right there next to the tar sands. That sounds about right. That's what, how colonialism works. And for her master's thesis, she built a 20 kilowatt solar panel to power her health center. So I wanna say that because you can do all kinds of stuff when you're in academia. So her master's program was she put up 20 kilowatts of solar. That's a very cool thing to do. Next picture. This is a Hopi Solar Project 27 megawatts down at Kayenta. Oh, so sorry. I have to, someone else is trying to get on here. This is the Hopi Solar Project. And this is down there. Um, and this is the Na Navajo Solar Project down at Kayenta on their, on their reservation. And it's 27 megawatts, I believe. Next picture. This is what we need to do is we need to reindustrialize America. You know, when I was talking about the 51,000 companies, I mean, it's like 80% or 75% of the ibuprofen, you know, all of, our, all of our medicines are made in China. And we just think about this, and I think that the, the trick would be, uh, you need to make some stuff local if you wanna use it. So this is a picture taken in the Port of Duluth. You know, and I, it's this like amazing moment in time. I'm driving up towards some hearing on the pipeline and there you are. And uh, um, there you are and, 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 you, and you get up there and they have a, a, I was like cross the pipeline route and there was a pipeline on both sides of me. And then I seen these wind turbines coming my way. And I was like, why are they coming from Duluth? It's because they're all made in Europe. We don't make any of these things in this country. And so we just import them, you know? So, the, the thing is, is build an economy that makes sense. Make things locally. That's what we ought to do. Next picture. And pray hard. This is a picture of Emoto. I don't know if you, um, he's a Japanese scientist and he's really, he's done all this work with water. And you know, in the, in the commodification of the sacred, you know, one of the things that happened is, is, that, is that they uh, commodified everything, including water. And um, water is life and it is alive. And so what he did is he did like different tests on water crystals. They'd freeze the water and they all look different. And then some of them be like all messed up. If they were dirty water, they'd have like all crazy. And then they were like clean water. They, they look really good. And, and uh, so he started praying <laughs> to the water. And then he'd also have... Uh, have the people like, they play different kind of music. The water didn't like the punk rock music. The water liked the classical music. I don't know, but that's how um, they restored water crystals. So I just wanna say that because it is possible to do something beautiful and, and to make things beautiful. And that's what we gotta do. Next picture. And uh, acknowledge and support the rights of nature. You know, for too long, the rights of corporations have superseded the, uh, the rights of, of uh, the natural world. And on a worldwide scale, you know, more countries, uh, starting with Bolivia, declared uh, the rights of, of nature, the rights of Mother Earth as a part of their constitutions. And more recently, you know, um, the Himalayas, um, our tribe, uh, the rights of wild rice is what we, um, we secured. And um, the rights of the Yurok's for the uh, Klamath River, there's a lot of that. And so, you know, we, this is an opportunity for transformation and in, the, in that time, let's do this. Let's make this transformation and um, let's, let's make some things that are more beautiful. Next picture. That's me at Honor the Earth. You can take a look at us and all our work, but thank you for your time. I'm happy to answer some questions if you like. Thank you so much, Winona, for such honest hope. Um, while folks are typing in questions, and thank you for, for taking their questions, you know, 
something about your presentation, like I called it honest hope and um, reminded me of a, I think it's an Onondaga passage, but you, you may be able to correct me that uh, it goes something like, they tried to bury us, but they didn't know we were seeds. Yeah, no, that's right. I think it's a, a Mexican or a Zapatista. They tried to bury us, but they forgot that we were seeds. You know, and, so and to me, like this here, like this, you know, I don't know if you can see this, but this is these corn varieties. And, and you know, I feel like a seed is like a, a promise and hope and a commitment. When you plant that seed, you're like, I'm going to give you my best shot and we're going to try to work this out. And I got this field full of like the most stunning corn. I have piles up here that we're braiding. And, um, you know, I didn't know what I was going to get, but it was a pretty calm year, but I planted a short season variety and I did good. You know, you got to think But it, it gave me a lot of hope when I saw the field. Well, and to see the corn as a relation and then to learn from that and to see oneself as a seed is, is very powerful. You know, a, a student uh, who actually uh, I know quite well, Dylan Aguilar here asks, and, and by the way, Dylan uh, quoted your dad. Your last talk here at Western Winona, you mentioned your dad saying, I don't care about your philosophies until you can grow corn. And, and Dylan was really moved by that. <laughs> but he says here. No, that's exactly true. And I think of that all the time, you know. <laughs> he was a smart guy. And, you know, it yeah. is interesting. The more, um, you know, the, I don't want to say the older you get, but you, you understand your parents more, you know. Um, and um, I think now, you know, because I, I mean, I have to say that these have been, the past six months have been some of the most amazing times of, in my life, you know, and, and also just this opportunity to just like, not just slow down just to be here because you ain't going nowhere else. And yeah. so when you're there, like, how do you make it right? How do you make something? Like, I, you know, I, I, cannot, I cannot do everything, but I can, in this place, make something that is good and, and show some people that there's a way to have something that's good. You know yeah. what else was really interesting when we relocalized here, because we all relocalized like you did, is that we relocalized with the Amish. My neighbors are all Amish just south of the reservation. Super interesting, you know? And so then you look at what a local economy that looks like and I go and see my Amish farmer, you know, and I have a little milk addiction or a half and half for my coffee right here half and half. I could just get straight cream. You know what? Three bucks a quart for cream. Y'all hear that? Three dollars a quart for cream from the Amish. You're not getting it because you're not here. But my point is, is I said, oh, I could pay you more. They said, no, that's enough. We're good. Well, we've got... <laughs> Who says that? We're good. That's enough. That's it. Okay, what's our questions? Well, yeah, so Dylan was asking about hemp as medicine for earth and people, to think of it in the framework of medicine. Yeah, I am learning, you know, okay, so me and cannabis, I was raised in the Emerald Triangle. Do you know that? I was raised in Southern Oregon that's all burning now. That's where I was Ashland. raised. Ashland, yeah. I was raised in Ashland, remember that? So all yeah. kind of cannabis. I used to smoke 14, 15, 16 years old. Then I went off to college and I quit smoking, okay? I just want to tell you this, right? All right, I did. Then I quit smoking. And I was like all doing all this hard work and everything like that. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden, the world changed and actually a horse flipped over on me five years ago and then I started to smoke again. But my point was, is that I didn't appreciate it because I didn't really, I was like, I don't wanna get high. I don't wanna be all high, right? But it's a great physical medicine and everybody here knows that. It has a good, you know, it treated as a respectfully as a medicine is a great medicine, but it is the same kind of medicine for the earth because hemp bioremediates is what it does. And hemp crete or hemp sequesters carbon because it grows so rapidly. And so you could replace concrete, which is like, um, I, you know, it's like the, one of the most significant man-made substances in the world. You could replace that with hemp crete and, and conserve a lot of carbon. So it's the answer on so many levels. And we need to, Colorado needs to take some leadership on it. But, you know, one of the things that concerns me is, is like, everybody wants to grow cannabis now. They're like, I'm gonna make a million bucks. No, that's not what we want to do. Not everybody should grow cannabis. People should grow their own. But hemp needs to be grown at a scale. You know, I mean, at some scale, you could, each farm could do their own. But 
you know, some people should just grow food and some people, if they got a little extra land, they could make fabric. Yeah. Well, you know, um, if, if I may, I'd like to read through the 14 questions we have just so you can hear them. You can kind of hear where people are at. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then you can kind of either pick one or try to get at the essence of what they maybe share. Um, and so someone said, is this how we save the world in your opinion? This, this larger vision that you shared tonight. One person just wanted to say they liked your nobody cares about a bat COVID reference. Um, thinking more people need, need to hear that. Um, you open with a shout out to art. How do you think art can be utilized to advocate a regenerative economy? Um, what are the positive impacts you've seen from localizing your community system of food, your community food system? A lot of folks who watched your last video, I'm curious one decade later, what you've seen. Uh, what variety of corn did you show us? What improvements, mistakes have we made on our food systems here in the US and on reservations since you last spoke? And how has uh, the Trump administration affected these changes? Um, what do you use the corn for? Do you eat it or have other uses? Um, I would love Winona to, uh, I'd love to hear a bit more about your, your feelings regarding Wateco and rematriation uh, from illustrious alum, Greg Pettis. Uh, Hemp is clearly better to grow ecologically than cotton. Is it better than bamboo as well? How do you explain the importance of biodiversity to someone who knows nothing about it and, and doesn't believe in climate change? That's an important question. Aren't these a lot of questions? Can we just start with a few of them and then go to the next few? That's yeah, just a I, lot of things. No, I just wanted to kind of let you hear the chorus a little bit. Sure, why don't we start with you know, one of the recurring questions is, you know, what's happened in food systems, especially in indigenous food systems in the US since your last talk here nine years ago? Oh, this rematriation is what we are talking about. You know, since I was there, there has this, been this really widespread movement to reclaim seeds across Indian country, plus not only the seeds, but all of the technology associated with how you grow, you know, you grow your food and how you cook it and prepare it. And I've seen this renaissance that is absolutely, you know, just breathtaking. And uh, I see it in so many different places. And then I see like, just like that Gete Okosum and you see these seeds everywhere and people are bringing in new, new, you know, new seeds. And, you know, but the term rematriation was really important, kind of the reclaiming of, of our terms, you know, because the idea of repatriating is always one thing, but rematriating reaffirms the feminine relationship to the seed. And so um, great leaders like Rowan White from the Indigenous Seed Keepers Association and Elizabeth Hoover um, written widely on this. Um, really remarkable, you know, remarkable farming renaissance and, and a growth in that, you know. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm really proud of, of, all of all of that work. Excellent. And you know, that's that, you know, a question about local food economies. Others are asking about regional energy economies. Um, uh, one of our MEM grads. Let's watch Minnesota. We are going to have so much fun. My God. Well, so first, everybody, asking all these you here, all got to get out and vote. Everybody knows they got to get out and vote, right? So, <laughs> well, I, yeah. assuming there'd be applause if we were in Taylor Auditorium. Um, one, one, one person here is asking about your campaign, recognizing that commissioners are appointed in Minnesota for the uh, Minnesota Public Utilities Commission, um, what perspective do you hope to bring that you thought was missing? Um, Somebody noticed in Colorado that I ran for the Public Utilities Commission? He, he's in California, but he, he is a uh, full-on uh, solar renewable energy guru. So yeah, yeah. I mean, so look at this. So you just hung out with me. I am really interested in energy policy and utilities and infrastructure. I just spent seven years at the Public Utilities Commission trying to get them to do the right thing. And so then the vacancy opened on the board and I was like, yeah, why don't y'all hire me, put me on there because I can help you out because I can give you a little bit of a light instead of like the, the same box that you guys got yourself into with public policy. You know, if you're talking about climate change, everybody in the room knows is that climate change destabilizes infrastructure. Add a couple of wildfires to that, PG&E's infrastructure, what do you get? Crazy. The entire West Coast is on fire. The PG&E fire was a perfect example of that. So what you got to do is you got to build local resilient infrastructure for energy. 
That's what smart societies would do, which means the bucks don't go all to the big guys, but that idea of economies of scale didn't make sense anyway. That's what I was trying to explain earlier. Like big is not better because it's not agile. You need to have small and be beautiful and a little bit more modest and we'll be okay. You know, so build systems that include, you know, resilient systems, use less, don't be pigs and waste so much, home power as much as you can. You know, how idiotic is it that people go out there and they go to the gym, like get a bike in your house, power your laptop with your bike. You know, there you go. You know what I'm saying is it's like, get smart, quit doing dumb stuff and build a, systems that reflect <laughs> that, you know? I have a colleague who went to Humboldt and they once had a music stage powered by bikes ridden by the fans. And if they didn't like the band, they just stopped riding their bikes. Uh, so a couple of questions here. I think I do that once for me. I had I I I, I tried to give the lecture and power the speech. But I was like, can't do that one. <laughs> I have a couple of questions uh, about localizing economies again. Um, when you focus on working to relocalize, does this change attitudes of local people beyond your core group? That reminds me of the person who was asking about uh, how do you talk with climate deniers. Um, and so others are asking about some of the challenges you face when localizing your economy. So. If you could talk That's a really interesting question. So this is northern Minnesota. This is the deep north. That's why Trump came here. You know, I mean, that's why he came. He came to like faster, more violence and Indian heating for sure. That's what he did. But he's good at that. So, you know, so you have on one hand, you have these like really conservative, mostly, I have to say mostly German. I don't want to be all picky on this. The Norwegians and Finns, the Finns are kind of chill. The Amish are pretty chill. You know, they don't vote. And then there's the Indians, you know? And then because of globalization, you got a big Somali community up here. So it's super interesting because I'm like, well, we're all together now, huh? <laughs> so, you know, just there's a lot of talk. There's a lot of interest. I mean, you guys saw a couple of pictures and y'all hung out with me. So I, we own two farms on corners, hemp farms, all this stuff. People are really like looking. And first they were like, Oh, they're all growing marijuana over there. I was like, nope, can't smoke it. And then now they're all really looking and people are getting that we have a problem. And I saw the same thing other people did too. People, you know, we started regrowing food, you know, started growing food again. People started, you know, looking at how to take care of each other because, you know, there's not somebody going to come out here and take care of you. I think that it's been really, really good. And I'm, I'm trying to build a multiracial economy I'm just saying like the Ojibwe's, the Amish and the Somalis and the Hmong. That's my plan. Cause I got all kinds of people like these communities that are down to the twin cities and, and we have a combination of things that's, that's starting to work together. So that's what I'm working on. A couple, a couple of questions have intersected around um, what indigenous sustainability means. Another person talked about 10 years ago, you talked a lot about the sacred and has your definition of the sacred changed from your involvement in indigenous sustainability movements? So, so how would you define indigenous, indigenous sustainability? How has your view of the sacred evolved from your involvement in, in that movement? You know, I, I find that uh, each day you have an opportunity to reaffirm your relationship to the sacred. That, and you know, you, you look out there and, and you live in a beautiful place as do I. I look out there at the, at the, at the, the wonder that is there. And you know, a lot of my work is in, is in <laughs> trying to restore that relationship so it's right. And I, uh, I, I find it's, you know, ac across, across, you know, it is, um, you know, pretty broad sweeping from, you know, throughout my region, whether it's water quality issues, you know, with the water, you know, drop and industrial agriculture or the lakes or the wild rice, you know, it is all the same, you know, reaffirmation of relationship with ceremonies and prayers and then also just our actions. Wow. And so I know a number of people are thinking, you know, you, you, I love the way you tied the historic, uh, the, the, the long-term future, the ancestral to the daily there. And a lot of people are asking in here, what do we do now? What, um, 
how do we go about enacting change in, like this in our own in our own community starting tomorrow morning? Um, what kind of next steps advice do you have for folks who are inspired by the vision and the and the case studies and the the theoretical hope and the, the roots in the sacred, but aren't sure where to start? Well, no time like the present. <laughs> good, 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 good to move out, move on now. Good to get going on this. I mean, you know, in, in, in each arena you look in, there is, you know, there, there is the need for change. And so just, just begin, just do it. You know, I mean, I, I kind of take stock of myself each day the best I can and say, you know, hope I can do the best I can today. You can't do everything, but you can try to do your, you know, try to do your best. So then take something, you know, I mean, well, when you, when you work in the garden, the, the, you know, what I noticed is when I relocalized, like my, my watch didn't make a lot of difference anymore. I lost track of days. Did y'all lose track of days too? I just lost track of days, right? I canceled all these things, you know, and, and, uh, and what mattered is <laughs> with the sap was running, if it was frosting, if you could plant, you know what I'm saying? It's like things change, what's important. So be very present, you know, in your own world to figure out what, what it is in the seasons and, and, you know, build self-reliance. Um, Build community self-reliance. It's it 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 makes us a lot more secure, and um, I want to say, you know, we suffer. This society suffers from. I think it is called late stage affluenza. Do you ever hear that term, affluenza? Yeah. You know, and uh, we got so. You know, we all want to be free, but how much of our time do we spend looking at something about this big? Right? You got the whole darn world and you're right here. <laughs> I mean, I'm there with you too, but you know, think about like where we are and what you as an individual can do to begin making this, you know, your place better. And each of us has got some pieces in that and the collect, it, change is gonna be local and change is gonna grow into, as, as movements grow though nationally. I mean, there's no going back. They ain't putting up that Columbus statue in Denver anymore, are they? <laughs> it's not going back. The Redskins, they don't get their name anymore, do they? Right? It's not, it, we're not going back. We're done. So keep moving. A lot of people asking about corn, and I think it relates to what you're saying about going local. And I think to, to make that comment a little more bite-sized, I'm going to remember back to your, your talk here nine years ago where you talked about uh, ricing, you know, it's uh, the wild ricing moon right now, I believe. And you said either it was yourself felt this way or an elder in your community said, you know, I'm not Anishinaabe without wild rice in my stomach during the wild ricing moon in September. And it seems like, you know, going local means first finding what's your version of that, that of that rice, what's one's version of that rice. And I feel like you're getting at that with corn. Could you talk a bit more about the corn you showed us, uh, the importance of corn. I think each of us needs a portal, a place-based portal into going local where we are versus the general challenge to be more locally active. If we can find that, you know, for me, it's snowpack above the Rockies or the basis economically, ecologically, culturally, spiritually for my life. Um, you know, could you talk about the corn you shared with us and, and how corn gives people like a, your corn for you, but like metaphorically corn for all of us, gives us like a first step toward what that going local looks like? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. First is like where I live is a little bit like where you, is a little bit like where you live, but there is a wild, there's a garden out there. You take care of your ecosystem. And in our case, there's wild rice. You can get sugar from a tree and rice from a lake. You know, you can get every kind of berry. You can dig all kinds of roots. You can eat m milkweed. You know, people don't even eat, you know, there's so many things you can just eat. So you don't need to grow a garden if you, if you care for your world, right? But then we need to enhance that because the biodiversity is diminishing. And so, you know, a lot of the things I do is like, I'm interested in is like reforesting, 
or rewilding or restoring very, you know, restoring those things that are supposed to be there, right? Keep growing out those things and then growing out your garden. So, you know, there's a lot of ecological restoration work that is really important to do. And that helps bring back all the life that needs to be in the garden that the creator made for you already. And then you make the other gardens after that, you know, because we can't go in that area. We need to take care of those areas. But, you know, I feel like that, that slowly weaning ourselves. And I think a lot about different, you know, Wes Jackson, right? <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. So Wes Jackson, I always love everything he says. He says a couple of things. He said a lot of cool things. So one time he said this milling about theory. And he's <laughs> like, you know, only, uh, just, you know, just stick with them like a mile and don't, don't go a lot further. Don't be super ambitious and you won't mess anything up. You know, I think about that because we're like way too fast. And that's one of the things COVID taught us is like, chill out. Y'all just chill out. So you it's know? laughing because just for people who are listening and don't know Wes, Wes is telling us to just chill out. And this is the man who's developed the first new grain in 5,000 years and the first perennial grain in human history and claims he's going to restore the function of the, of the prairie in a way that's edible and that fuels us, right? And so, so how do you combine that audac audacity with that chilling out of Wes? How do those? Well, then the other thing Wes says is that if you're working on something you plan on finishing in your lifetime, you're not thinking <laughs> big enough, no. right? So do both, you know, do both. Be the you know, be, but be a little more simple, you know? I mean, I had, town's a four letter word for me, it always was, but you know, now it's really a four letter word. You don't want to go to town, right? So we got all like, oh, I gotta go get this. No, you don't, you know? Oh my God, I did this archeological work in my house. I got so much stuff I could just like upcycle for 20 years, my God. Another you know, we, we, was we live in a society where we spend time collecting stuff and then hiring people to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We have, you know, I think, you know, one of our graduates here, Sam Rowland, she's a teacher. And I think maybe for her, I can't speak for her, but knowing, from reading her work through the years and knowing her, maybe her rice is teaching. She asked you, she said, you worked as a principal in public education. In your view, what could public education do to reform ideologies around stewardship, especially in urban school systems with limited access to resources and the capital O outdoors? And I think this is where we're starting to move toward our, our theme of inclusive uh, intersectional environmentalism for the weekend. Um, but in terms of your work as a principal, how you view education now, influencing stewardship, taking on those social inequities in terms of who has access uh, to environmental education, in urban areas, what, what are your, some of your thoughts on that, on how to transfer this vision to people who don't get to go to Colorado and college surrounded by nine wilderness areas? Right. Um, get some bees on the rooftop. <laughs> you know, I mean, I was up in Winnipeg at the Fort Geary Hotel, fanciest hotel there, there's bees on the rooftop. You know, rebuild, you know, life. Make sure, take care of life around you, bring more life back into the city. You know, keep doing that and then, and, and, and then just keep being mindful and, and support us where the wild things are to keep things that way, you know? And then I laugh because I'm basically a principal again. I just got quarantined with a bunch of kids and I was like, wait, wait. Oh, you have so a I think of it as an opportunity. <laughs> I'm looking at it as a great opportunity. I get to spend, you know, six months, year. I guess, spend, let's just say I spend a year. I already spent six months year, two years with a bunch of kids. That's my retirement plan. Mm -hmm. My 401k ain't gonna be worth nothing, baby. You know what I'm saying? That portal. The portal starts in your home, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just walking through that portal. I'm gonna take a bunch of kids with me. I mean, you know, my, my, my retirement plan is to raise some coherent descendants. Yeah. <laughs> well, th this might flow out of that in terms of, you know, beginning the portal, beginning with the pandemic portal, beginning with the family and and healing that, you know, uh, one of our students here, uh, Erickson, you're going to like this. He changed the name of the Sustainability Coalition to the Healing Coalition. And he has a question right. here. Uh, wh what do you feel is the best road to take to heal connections uh, between people and people and, and people and environment, right? How, like the, you're talking about the beehive on the roof, right? That, that may heal 
a, a relationship with plant in terms of pollinators, but how's it also healing people and people? Yeah, I mean, I realized, you know, I've, I've been thinking about restorative justice, you know, and, and I realized that like, I was like, I don't know, that's not really my thing. I'm like, you know, but then I was, you know, cause there's all this crazy stuff going on there and people say, you should work on that. I'm like, no, but then I was like, well, that's basically what I do. It's all restorative justice. Like, how do you restore a just relationship? Because you know, if you're treating your, if you know, if you're treating your your relatives that have four legs or whatever it is badly, you know, if you're treating your your environment badly, you're treating yourself badly too, you know. And and it needs to be this whole, you know. I just look at it as a really a, a holistic approach, of uh, of um, yeah. That's basically how how I look at it. Yeah, I guess that does transition into the weekend you know tomorrow morning i don't know if you've read michael mendez's climate change from the streets um it's an excellent book just came out from yale press he'll he'll be speaking in the morning we have ashley pearl from um uh, uh city of aspen a climate action planner this uh, leads their canary ancient initiative and they're going to kind of get folks thinking about you know what is you know on the ground climate action planning look like and what does it mean for that to be inclusive anti-racist um, in the afternoon, our, our, our county sustainability leader, uh, John Cattles, is going to lead us on a simulation of how to get Gunnison to carbon neutrality. So I get my question for you is how to bring the justice, anti-racist, post-colonial equation uh, into the climate action conversation, into climate action planning. I mean, a couple of things. First, I wanted to say that uh, the Blue Lake Rancheria in California, they have a megawatt of solar and a megawatt of battery power. And if I was looking at a community to model myself after, I'd look at them. Because in all these PG&E fires, that tribe is the only, like, they're like this little spot, you know? Can you say it again? Can you say Blue it again? Lake Rancheria. Blue Lake Rancheria. And, they, and they, there's like the PG&E Blue Lake Rancheria, like this juxtaposition between a, you know, this mega project and this little tribe, you know, so there's a lot to be learned. And I think that's one thing. Second thing I want to say is like, I feel like the indigenous people actually have a lot of ability to provide leadership in this. I feel like we got the plan in Northern Minnesota. I'm like, y'all give me those reins because we got a plan and y'all don't, you know? And I feel like that there are a lot of places where these tribes have had to kind of like work from nothing. Oh, look at that Cree writing on there. Um, <laughs> you know, that work with nothing. And so we made something because we had to be resilient, you know? And so there's this opportunity to kind of learn and build partnerships. And also, you know, in the times that we are, because tribes have different jurisdiction to, to, to work in that arena. You know, and in the larger picture, I mean, you know, you said it at the beginning. I mean, the fact is, is that climate change and a lot of these crises certainly are not evenly felt. You know, the impacts are, are very tough. You know, some of these tribes hit with the COVID, you know, African-Americans, highest rates of mortality. I mean, the fact is, is that, that justice looks like we all are well. <laughs> you know, justice, justice, justice looks like we have the resources. And it's not just, you know, I mean, I think a lot about land justice. I mean, all of those national parks were carved out of Indian territory. You know, you could just start with the Black Hills of South Dakota. You could go to Glacier, you could go to Yellowstone, you could go to Yosemite, all of them. They kick the Indians out of or just like make it very difficult for them. You know, could talk about the Grand Canyon, you know, have a soup pie. So let us talk about how, you know, that's, that's kind of this restorative process in the West, you know, that needs to, needs to be there, you know? So how would, you said, you know, we've got the plan, y'all don't in terms, and I think you mean that in terms of, of energy, but it seems you also mean it in terms of autonomy, agency, um, sense of ancestral instructions. I guess one of my questions then with that would be, um, I guess, give us some specifics there. What does that look like to say, we've got the plan, y'all don't? Help okay, us. that sounded kind of mean, but I'm kind of irritated at the state of Minnesota here. You know, okay, so I mean, I just gave you some elements of the plan. This is what you look like. This is like you start with like Minopamata Zewan, that's the good life. That's a lot different than gross national uh, income, GNP. It's gross national happiness indexing. 
you need to change your indexing system. That's like a much more indigenous system of be happy. Don't be rich because that's not going to make you happy. Two, you got to live like not like you're in conquest. You got to live like you want to survive. The next economy is not about competition. It's about, it's about cooperation. If we want to live, we've got to work together, right? It has to be about justice because justice is with the natural world and justice is with each other and justice with their relatives. You can't run facty farming operations and pretend like you got justice, you know, because that is not justice. You know, you, they, you know, you got to rebuild the infrastructure of this country. I mean, you need a structural adjustment. The United States has lectured the world about structural adjustment, but the United States needs a structural adjustment. You can't have such an inefficient economy, waste 70% of your energy between point of origin and point of consumption, have a food system that wastes 40% of the food system and tell me that that works. You don't want to go back to normal, you want to get better. You know, so you rebuild local food systems that are resilient, that are based on organics, that are based on biodiversity. You know, this is the kind of stuff indigenous people have been saying, but a lot of people have been saying. 70% of the food on a worldwide scale is grown by farmers who are not Monsanto, Kraft, or anybody like that. That's who grows food. You build infrastructure that matters. Clean up your, you know, your leaking vein, gas <laughs> mains, all that stuff, you know? Build something that, that do that, does that. Transform your justice system. I think that cannabis has a really good opportunity. That's what part of the reason I'm interested in it, because if you legalize cannabis, First of all, you have to decriminalize and you have to give justice to the, in, you know, the unfair um, punishment of people of color for having a joint <laughs> or whatever. You know, I mean, it's been, the war on drugs has been leveled at people of color for years. You know? and, and so when they open those dispensaries in LA, there's this group called uh, Fourth Movement that demanded that some of those dispensaries were owned by people of color. So it should be in a lot of these places. You know, this is not, the, the next economy should not be owned by white men. They should be sit, sit on the sidelines, you know? They certainly have made enough decisions, frankly, you know, and, and, and we can't say that they haven't been in charge of stuff. I mean, look at Congress, <laughs> look at the businesses. Everything is white men. And it looks like things haven't, decisions haven't been so good recently. So we might want to rethink some of those. I'm just saying, chill out, guys. Chill out, guys. We could do this, it's okay. We can work together. Let's take a little break, you know? And then, and you know, and, and so it's across every sector. Healthcare, I just spent 10 days in the hospital with my grandson, 10 days, 10 days in the hospital, right? You know, blessed for that hospital system for saving that kid. You know, at the same time, I'm looking at that saying, why is the healthcare system so huge? Why is it the fifth largest industry in the country right now? That's because we're all sick. <laughs> It's all sick and they're building businesses on that. You don't want to build business on sickness. You want to build business on wellness, you know? And then they have all that medical waste. So I'm saying is it's like people like Paul Hawken, you know, there's people who have been talking about this documenting, you know, Amory and Hunter, just north of you. You know, there's visionaries that have been saying these pieces, you know, I mean, all of them, all of these visionaries, Lester Brown, Earth 2.0 or 4.0 or wherever heck that guy is at now. Right. So I'm saying is, is that there are so many examples of visionary people doing visionary work on a worldwide scale that have been documented. Do yours. So I'm saying, everybody do your thing. Just do it. You know, and that's how change is made. You know, and there's a lot of good examples out there. Well, and you know, I, I'm looking at the questions here coming in still, um, I'll ask the, the audience to take a breath and think about the flow of the conversation and, and please go ahead and put in a final question that comes out of this flow. And Winona, while they're doing that, there's a question here that says, uh, if you could speak a little bit more about your feelings regarding Wateco and rematriation. Oh, what, oh that's right, Windigo. So Wateco is a Cree word, but Windigo is the Ojibwe word, Windigo. Okay, so Wendigo is a cannibal spirit that comes in the winter time and lays to waste villages. And our people have a history of fighting Wendigos. We have these epic history stories. I was like up in this Boundary Waters cabin reading these old stories, you know? And I was like, it's just like the Navajo, the Diné people and the monster slayers. And I remember Anna Rondon one time, she said to me, 
she's a Navajo organizer. She said, we need a new generation of monster slayers. Well, I was like, yeah, that's what we do. And they're out there. I mean, Exxon did not fall to its demise on its own, did it? You know? You know, a combination of the power of, of Mother Nature and just the, you know, a lot of pressure of people like you, John, all of us, transforming the society. So, you know, what I, is Windigo capitalism is the capitalism where you just keep consuming, you know? And so you got, you know, a copper ore deposit in the Boundary Waters that a Canadian multinational wants that's less than 1% ore. I mean, that's bottom of the barrel stuff, isn't it? Sure is. You know, the dirtiest oil in the world, the tar sands or mm -hmm. fracking, where you got to go, you know, blow up the bedrock of Mother Earth to get something out and put down 600 chemicals. Colorado, I mean, that's the bottom of the barrel. That's when to go capitalism. When you're done being cannibals, you might want to figure out what's better. You know, and we got to, we got to, we got to tame our inner Windigos, which are sitting there and like filling our heads full of stupid. You know, being in the hospital, you watch a lot of TV. I was like, oh my God, people watch this stuff. My point is, is that, you know, we, we just start consuming all of this stuff. And this endless level of consumption, 70% of our economy is consumption in America. That's like, chill out. Just chill out. You don't all need that stuff, you know? And so that's what we got to do is just, you know, start consuming less. And, and these corporations need to be, you know, I'm looking at the Enbridge Corporation. It's got six pipelines. I'm like, six is enough, baby. You need to start cleaning up your mess. You know, you can't have like endless access. So that's when to go capitalism and it's, it's ending. It's collapsing. That economic system is collapsing. I mean, minus $38 a barrel for oil. That is not a good price for an oil company, is it? Well, and you, you merge, you know, what Bell Hooks calls sort of white supremacist capitalist patriarchy here, right? And the, 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 the person who asked this question asked about rematriation. Um, is that yeah. the vision? Could you talk about that a little bit? Uh, and yeah. Okay. So I'm thinking about this now. I'm actually working on a book on this subject here. And so, but, you know, the thing that interests me is like, you think of that, you know, Lord of the Rings and it's the return of the king. And I think what you need is the return of the matriarchs. That's what I think. I think it's more than one. You can't have like the, this concentrated and what you need is, you know, what you find is that first of all, if you looked around like the countries that had the best COVID policy to start with were women, right? And then you work, look around and you see that the most visionary leaders, you know, I mean, they, as I already said, a lot of crazy stuff happened and it's time for restoring a balance. And, and so you look on any scale and they say like loan projects in Africa, you distribute the money to women, it gets a lot further, builds a lot more social capital, builds a lot more wealth. There's a better distribution system. And women are also a lot more, I think, um, you know, I mean, I, I love everybody, you know, and this is sound a little, I sound like a little ranting, but my point is, is that is like restorative justice and matriarchal thinking is how do you get everybody to the table and how do you get everybody fed? Those are things that are not about empire. <laughs> that's the I think opposite. that's I think that's worth repeating. Matriarchal thinking is how do you get everybody to the table and how do you get everybody fed? Yeah, that's what I think. You know, I'm my phone's kind of blown up with texts about, you know, you know, asking you, given that we're talking about matriarchy. I think you know that Ruth Bader Ginsburg, RBG, passed away today. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, such a fighter for, for women's choice and um, for making sure everybody's fed as well in terms of her, her views of health care and, and, and democracy in the face of fascism. And I'm just, just curious if there's anything you want to say to people who are hurting right now from that news. I loved her. We all did, man. That's a tough girl, huh? Yeah. What do you call her? A nasty woman? There's a lot. That doesn't narrow it down, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, she's just amazing. And uh, yeah, it is a sad thing to hear her. I just love every time I turn around and, you know, something else that she was, she was, she was saying. And uh, yeah, I'm sad. I was sad to hear that. I was sad to yeah. hear that. 
Well, I think someone who really admires you here is, is asking you, you know, just how to become so well versed on all these topics. You're so wise. And uh, I, I love how really you keep it. This person says, and others asking what else can we do other than vote? Right. Um, and uh, this, this is an important time of year to challenge people on doing more than voting. Uh, you've already started to talk about it. Like wake up tomorrow. Rebuild your, so yeah, rebuild your country, girls and boys. Let's do this. Roll up our sleeves. Let's go. You know, rebuild this because it's not going to get built by someone in Washington or, you know, somebody in Denver. It's going to get built. It's going to get built by us, you know, the right way. And we got to remake things. We got to do things right. And uh, that's like, I feel like this is this spiritual opportunity to be the people that stop them from genetically engineering the world's food supply, that figure out how to live without, you know, within a respectful manner that can restore a river that can bring hemp back, you know, that can make life. What a great spiritual opportunity. I mean, I could see the, I could see the stars really clear this, this summer, you know? They said that COVID was like a 20% decrease in air pollution or something. I don't know, but you know, I was like, I'll take that break. I'll take that remember, break. With you talking about the spiritual opportunity, I remember when I was visiting, I was, interviewing you about an essay by Aldo Leopold where he says there's a spiritual danger in not knowing where your food and heat come from. And I said, you know, what do you think he's getting at? And, and without pause, you said, he's talking about the spiritual danger of not giving a shit. But it seems like now, you know, seven years later, you're talking about uh, moving, you know, rather than like the spiritual danger of not giving a shit, you're talking about like the spiritual danger of like not archeologically digging into your home and, and making sure everybody's fed at the table of your family and seeing the stars. It, it seems more like a looking forward rather than a getting away from, uh, is that fair? That there's been a, a maybe yeah. even more hopeful shift in your thinking through such horrible years? Yeah, I mean, in, in, the, in the crazy that is there out there, there's a <laughs> tremendous shift. And I'm like, ride that wave, you know? And I'm gonna ride that wave with a bunch of kids. I'm going, I'm going with them, you know? I mean, it's an interesting time and they give me a great deal of hope just seeing, you know, that uh, the transition from, from, you know, what has happened to them to what they become when they, are, when they are kids on a farm with horses and plants, you know? Life, life, life can heal you, you know? Life can heal you and uh, so take that, you know, take this time. I mean, we're first world people. We're privileged as heck, you know, in our privilege, you know, figure out how we can use as much, re reclaim our power and, and, and make things beautiful. You know, that's what I think is, the, is what we need to do. And everybody's got a different way to do that, but you better vote, better vote, you know. Well, my friend, uh, it's an honor to call you that. And I think ending with reclaim your power and ride the wave with kids, I think is a really perfect way to end the evening. And on behalf of, of, of Western and the Headwaters elders and all these Headwaters communities, I offer my gratitude. Thank you so much, Winona. Thank you for having me, Miigwech. 500 people clapping. Sorry, what's that? Miigwech, thank you.